Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Podcast on the Brink. Pleased to be joined this week by a first-time guest on the show, Jeremy Wu of Sports Illustrated, covers the NBA draft as well as anybody. Just recently up released a, a really good uh, draft big board over on Sports Illustrated's website. I encourage everybody to check that out. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. It's good to be talking to you. Hey, what's up, man? Glad to glad to be here. It's that time of year, uh, kind of getting more realistic and fun to actually talk about you know, the draft and what might happen. So, yeah. So I'm just curious for your background a little bit on covering the draft. Obviously, um, you've been doing this now for a while, and and you see a ton of college players. I'm just curious, just you know, how you got into this and, and kind of what piqued your interest in terms of covering the NBA draft. Yeah, basically. Um, so the short version of this story is that. Um, by the time, basically, I started off as an intern at SI, and by the time I got there, uh, I had already been working in, you know, basketball for, you know, a couple of years, um, doing, you know, scouting-related coverage, recruiting coverage, sort of like on my own, um, you know, in, I grew up in Chicago, I went to Northwestern, so I was in college, you know, sort of doing this stuff, and uh, a lot of good players, uh, you know, in the area at the time, you know, the Jabari Parker, Jaleel Okafor, Jalen Brunson, that era of guys. Um, so basically by the time I got to Sports Illustrated, um, you know, I had a working knowledge of kind of, you know, how grassroots worked. Uh, I was learning how to scout. I wasn't necessarily good at it. Um, but, <laughs> you know, they needed someone to help with the draft uh, aside that year. Uh, so I was doing sort of, you know, legwork on random guys and, you know, basically just also trying to get rehired back. <laughs> so, so anyway, they did keep me full time and it kind of just you know, over the years, uh, you know, as I became a full-time writer, it kind of became uh, sort of the lane that I operated in where they needed someone to do it. And I had the knowledge and I wanted to do it. Um, and again, I, I kind of had leeway to, you know, make mistakes and, uh, you know, grow into that, into that role. So, you know, I've been doing this for, you know, really 10 years working in basketball now, but, you know, eight years at SI and, um, you know, it just sort of has grown into its own thing. Uh, and also, you know, the more flexibility I've had to go to games and actually, know do the job the way that you know an NBA team would do it um I think the better uh, I've gotten at it as well so it's, it's been an interesting uh journey I would say so for the purposes of our discussion obviously all Indiana fans are interested in first and foremost is Trace Jackson Davis and kind of what he's gonna do from a draft perspective you had him I think 85th on your latest big board but Sounds like he's in the combine, so that maybe the NBA may see him a little bit higher based on my understanding of how that process works. For combine invites, the teams vote on who they like to see come in, and then I don't know if it's a set number. It's around, what, 60 or 70 guys that come in. But, what, I, I mean, just big picture right now, just starting with Trace, what what are – how how do you view him as a prospect? Obviously, you have him as a guy that you know seems like a second rounder at best in terms of your rankings. But what what are the considerations um, for him in terms of you know whether he uh, stays in the draft and and I guess how big is this combine coming up next week for for his future in terms of the NBA? Yeah, I think like it's been interesting you know watching him over the years. Um, you know, he's been really productive. He has that going for him. Like, I think, you know, I think if he goes in the draft, there's a chance he goes in the second round. He'll probably get a two-way contract. Uh, so I, I think, you know, speaking to players' individual decisions is, like, always hard because I don't know, you know, exactly the situation. But I think that, um, you know, he'll be in position where, you know, he'll be able to make money. And so it's just, it's just a matter of, you know, what he feels is better. Um, you know, is it worth at this point just – you know, going to the pros and challenging yourself to, to make that leap and sort of prove yourself in a different way, uh, or is it more appealing to come back and again, be the sort of the centerpiece of the team. Like, I think that's, you know, you could argue that either way. Um, but I think, you know, it's a good sign. He got invited to the combine. Uh, the way that they, they do that isn't always like, you know, they tally up the votes, but it's, you know, they're it's not always based on rankings, you know, and then guys turn down invites. So it's kind of an inexact thing. Uh, but, uh, he definitely, I think, has earned that just, you know, from the productivity he's had over the years. Um, you know, I, I think one critique uh, that I think is fair that I've heard from people around the NBA, is he hasn't really, like, added a whole ton to his game. You know, like, he's been sort of this, a better version of the same player for three years, right? Where, you know, good rebounder, plays hard. Um, you know, he's got the length to sort of compensate for the fact that he's not, you know, super, super tall for a center. Uh, but, you know, he hasn't really added any perimeter skills. You know, he still doesn't shoot threes, doesn't shoot that great from the line. Um, so, so for him, it's just a matter of, 
you know, like it wouldn't shock me at all if he's, you know, someone, you know, third big, uh, you know, because the way that rosters are going, the way the NBA is going, like it won't shock me if he's on a roster in three years. But uh, I think it's just sort of the value proposition there is kind of limited just because, you know, a lot of bigs come around every year. There's always bigs um, and bigs who don't shoot threes. I think they're a little bit more replaceable um, with the way teams play now, right? So, so for him, it's just a matter of, you know, what else am I going to do to sort of separate myself, uh, you know, from these other guys? And, and for him, it's, I think it's just going to have to be, uh, you know, playing harder than everyone else, um, just showing that, you know, the productivity that he's had, uh, you know, can continue, uh, you know, going up a level. Uh, so, that, so at the combine, I think, yeah, you know, if he comes in and, uh, you know, sort of like outworks the other bigs. Like, yeah, I think it's going to help. I mean, I, I'm just curious, like how the NBA teams view the combine in terms of how it impacts the draft stock for somebody because they have this whole body of work. And with somebody like Trace, they've seen him now for three years in college. They probably scouted him going back to high school. So is the, is the book kind of already written in terms of what he can be in terms of a draft prospect? Or does there is there... Are there examples of guys who come in and really show something different or show something maybe they haven't shown before and it, it elevates their stock or is it basically the teams already have their opinion of him and this is kind of what he is in terms of a prospect? Yeah. I mean, I'd say it's kind of a case by case thing a lot of the time. Um, I do think, you know, it's important to note that like uh, last year uh, it felt like the combine did really matter uh, where you saw a lot of guys who, chose not to play, you know, fall out of the draft or into the second round. Uh, there were you know, a lot of guys like that. And then on the flip side, uh, you know, you had guys who, you know, did play in at least one day of the combine and played well. You know, you had like Josh Primo and Bowen Thailand and guys like that. Uh, Quentin Grimes, who, you know, clearly were, uh, you know, more skilled and just like had a quality to them um, that sort of set them apart. Um you know, and when you see them in that group setting, and you know they immediately pop, like I get helped. Um, now, obviously, those are all guards. Uh, it's just a little bit different with bigs. Um, I think the other thing is that the combine setting is, you know, traditionally kind of tough for bigs, just because you're not going to get force-fed touches. Um, you know, it typically does favor the perimeter players. Uh, you know, for Trace, it may matter less, just because he doesn't necessarily need post-ups. You know, he can still go out rebound everyone and you know play with energy and, and do the things that he does well. Um, so again, it's like, I, I think, you know, with him having three years uh, of tape and everyone kind of you know, knows what he does and what he doesn't do, um, it probably matters a little bit less. Like, you know, the guys that I just mentioned were guys that, you know, for example, like Highland was coming from a smaller conference. People wanted to see him against better players or, you know, Primo didn't play a ton at Alabama. Uh, he just played a smaller role, was super young, uh, had some more mystery about him and then he plays really well, right? So it's a little different with, with Trace, just that, you know, considering he's older and more proven in some ways, probably matters less, but I'm not going to say it doesn't matter because, you know, historically it does, it can and does matter for, for players, you know, how you play at the combine. Um, so it will not hurt, you know, to show up and play well. If he comes back for another season, you know, a lot of people wonder, you know, obviously the younger you are, if you're a really good prospect, you're more valuable to a team because they can have you under control and develop you and, you know, get potentially more time out of you. The older you get as a player, I mean, if he comes back and has another great season in college and is all American and, you know, big 10 player of the year type player, I mean, his stock is most likely not going to move in any tangible way. Am I, is that a, is that a pretty fair assumption or are there examples of guys who come back for maybe a fourth season and they do are able to elevate their stock? I mean, would it be, he'd have to come back and show he can shoot threes or show a perimeter game or, or would there be something else he could do to maybe impact his stock in a positive way? Yeah, I, I think I think you're kind of right in some ways. Like, it is hard to come back uh, and improve your stock. You know, if you're already are already an upperclassman, you know, it's one thing if you're a freshman, freshman to sophomore. I think there's more potential to do that. Um, but uh, you know, having said that, I do think, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if guys add things to their game, then it does change. Uh, you know, so the way you think about it a little bit, right? I mean, that's always going to be the case. Like. Um, you know, he's had opportunities to do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be important to show that he can at least is now comfortable taking threes in the game, right? Like, you know, I've seen him shooting. That's not great. I don't think it's like a zero, like chance that he ever shoots, um, but he hasn't done it yet. Right? So you got to at some point see it and you want to see the confidence. Um, so yeah, I mean, you could look at him more like even Oscar Shibwe, you know, and another guy, similar type of player who had a great year, didn't get much traction and goes back. Right. So it's, 
it's tough, particularly for centers. Um, and I just, you know, I, I think, you know, considering possible NIL opportunities for guys, you know, going back to college, I think it can be more appealing now to, to stay and have a huge year. Um, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't say there's nothing he can improve on, um, but he's, you know, will really have to show that. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's always, you know, worth wondering, you know, maybe it's just better to do that, you know, change the environment around you um you know go to a different scheme you know try different stuff play with you know more advanced players and, and sometimes guys do take off like that right so you know, he could go to the g league have a great you know start of the season and get a call up really quick like it could it could be like that type of thing too so again for him it's just going to be personally you know what he what you know whether he feels he's ready for that or not i think one thing that really stood out to me just looking at your big board in general, you have 17 Big Ten players in the top 100. I don't think there's been very many years in recent memory that I can remember where you've had that many guys that were ranked in your top 100 from the league. You know, it kind of feels like in many ways the Big Ten talent has not been on par with ACC and SEC Big 12 now for for quite a while. You kind of look at through the McDonald's All American list and all that, and and some of the those leagues have been doing much better in terms of bringing in talent. I mean, is this in terms of Big Ten talent in recent memory, as good of a year as you can remember uh, for, for the league uh, going into the draft and into the combine? Yeah, I think so. Like, I think there's probably two things. Like, yeah, definitely higher talent level just up and down. If you look at, you know, the Jaden Ivey and Johnny Davis and Keegan Murray, I mean, those are three guys who I think in most years are going to be lottery picks, right? It's not just that this, this draft. It's like those are guys who, you know, any year I think would be really interesting for them to get. Um, but then, you know, you can go down the list. Um, you know, you even have the guys who are like Max Christie, who's clearly a project, but you know, does have uh, you know some stuff that teams are interested in developing. Um, and then you know, you can go down you know, even further. I mean, Trayvon Williams, you know, probably a you know second round two way type guy, sort of in similar bucket to to Trace uh, as a big. And then you have the guys from Michigan who uh, you know are younger. You know, Diabate and Houston. Um, and, you know, you have Pete Nance, you know, we're not, not sure if he's going to come out or not, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think, and you know, even Kofi, like, again, he's sort of in the same bucket where he's going to be a better college player than an NBA player in all likelihood, but he's going to turn pro anyway. Like uh, the depth of talent was there, uh, but also I, I think my list may be a little bit biased also just by the fact that I saw so much big time basketball with like those are guys who I feel comfortable placing. I think that's probably a factor where there is some like <laughs> regional uh, element that, that goes into it, but um yeah, I do think it was clearly a good year for the league. And if you're just looking at the high-end talent, um, you know, I'd have to go back and look at it. But I think, you know, turning out three legitimate lottery picks, maybe three top 10 picks from the Big Ten is pretty, pretty good. Who are the Big Ten guys that kind of have the most to gain potentially going into the combat? I mean, you've already got Jaden Ivey, number two. It feels like he's pretty much locked in. He's going to be a, you know, top five or six pick, depending on kind of which, which teams get which picks in the lottery. Uh, and, and, Murray and, and Davis also feel like they're at least going to, you know, may, maybe not so much Davis as a lock for the lottery, but Murray feels like he is. But kind of that next group of guys, it feels like there's some some variance in terms of how teams view them and, and where they could ultimately go. Who do you maybe see as one or two guys that can potentially either boost their stock significantly with the combine or, or maybe fall down uh, if they don't play uh, up to their potential? Uh, sure. Well, you, I just realized I – in this pre- my previous answer, I, I forgot about um, the guys from Ohio State, you know, Malachi Brand, I mean, Jay Bell. Yeah. Uh, you know, those guys could both go in the top 20. My guess is they probably don't play five and five at the combine, but shouldn't forget them. Um, but yeah, I, I think in terms of guys who are kind of like in position where they might want to actually play because it might actually help. Uh, I mean, I think two guys kind of come to mind. Uh, Bryce McGowan is one where, you know, Nebraska was really bad, but he showed some stuff. Um, you know, it was not a good setting. You know, it was kind of a selfish team, so it's always hard to be like, you know, is this a selfish player or how much of it is the environment, right? So, like, you know, if he plays in the combine, I don't know if he will, but you know, being a you know six seven scorer like that type of guy, uh, you know, typically, you know, can can uh, especially as, as a younger guy, you know, will have a chance to, you know, if you play well, you know, maybe do like what Josh Primo did, like play one day play well and then shut it down um i think you could look at you know i mentioned max christie uh you know he's one uh, another one where yeah you know it would definitely help him to be like hey i you know i'm ready for this you know i can 
uh, stand out relative to these other guys who are older than me, uh, more established maybe. Uh, you know, those are the type of guys who are kind of on the cusp for the first round who I think you'll have a chance to kind of vault. Um, and then, I, you know, I would mention Chris Murray also, who, you know, I think he probably goes back to Iowa. That seems to be the vibe uh, with that situation. But, uh, you know, he's a legit, legit prospect. Uh, you know, he's in my top 40. And, you know, if he goes back, I think there's a pretty good chance he's a first rounder next year. Uh, I don't know if he makes the same type of leap that, leap that Keegan made, um, you know, being a top 10 pick. But, uh, you know, not crazy. Like, he, he definitely has a lot of stuff to like. Um, you know, so those are three guys who I think are kind of in that bucket of, you know, fringe first round, early second round, definitely guys who are prospects who have interests um, who could really benefit. There seems to be a little bit of variance among the experts, um, not so much on Ivy and Murray, but on Johnny Davis, you have him seven. I've seen him lower in certain places. What, what in your, in your mind are the biggest question marks for him going into the draft and what, I mean, what kind of gave, gives you confidence that, to have him at seven and then what what maybe are some things that worry you in terms of what he can actually be as an NBA player is there anything you saw maybe that that gives you any pause on him sure um yeah so like I guess I'll preface this like I'm pretty familiar with Johnny you know I did a longer profile on him back in January like when he was tearing it up um you know I think he you know dealt with um you know different injuries over the course of the year that I think you know, he didn't want to talk about, I don't think anybody wanted to admit it, but I know that he wasn't playing at a hundred percent. Um, you know, so if you go back and look at the tape, what he was doing, you know, the first six weeks of the year, um, you know, I mean, that dude is really, really good. Um, I think, you know, also just in terms of like off the court intangibles, like he's going to check pretty much every box that you want. Like he's not somebody who I would want to, you know, under rank. Like I just, I think there's a pattern in his career where, you know, everywhere he's gone, he's been a little better than people expected. Uh, you know, this year a lot better, right? So it's just those are the type of guys where you know they're workers, you know, you know they care about the right stuff. Uh, you know, he's not a selfish player. You know, he's going to do what the team wants him to do. Like, I think he'll be comfortable, you know, not taking a billion shots a game. He's not going to have to do that because he is a really good rebounder. Uh, you know, he's unselfish. Um, he's tough. He's going to guard. Like, he's going to do role player stuff, but also has the upside to, you know, really expand his game as a scorer, right? I mean, he's a really good mid range scorer. Um, I think. You know, when he gets back fully healthy, I think we'll see that, you know, kind of come back. I think he's, I guess he shoots it better. Um, you know, I debated having him as high as five just because he's somebody who I, you know, I feel really comfortable with, um, you know, reaching whatever the high end of his ability is. I'm pretty sure he's going to get it out, um, you know, presuming health, like uh, just sort of knowing who he is as a competitor and what drives him and, and how much he cares. Um, so those are things that, yeah, when we're talking about the very top guys, you know, that, that often is what separates, um, you know, elite prospects is, is the the makeup. So, you know, I think there are teams who feel the same way. Like, I think, you know, that, uh, there's some concerns. I, I think the big thing for him is going to be, uh, you know, shooting the ball really well in workouts. Um, you know, if you can convince teams that he's a better three-point shooter than he showed, which, you know, I think he probably will be in time. Um, I think that's going to help for sure. Um, just in terms of, like, being able to ascribe, like, upside. Um you know, he, you know, Wisconsin system, I think, helped him in some ways, but also hurt him in some ways, just that, you know, he wasn't really able to show, you know, what type of game he has off the dribble, you know, isolation, that type of stuff. Like, he was getting more structured touches and a lot of, like, you know, difficult shots and standstill shots and, you know, see the way they play in the Big Ten. Um, you know, teams are hitting them and, you know, constantly making his life tough. So, yeah, I, I just think there's more upside there than he probably gets credit for. Um you know, so I would view him, you know, in that next group of, you know, really good prospects in the draft. Diabate and uh, Caleb Houston from Michigan were two guys that kind of came into the year. It feels like maybe a little bit, but more well, a little more well regarded than they are now. Uh, at least in your rankings, you got them. I think sixty-two and sixty-four. Is that just a product of kind of what? they were able to accomplish this season and maybe not meeting those expectations. And do those guys, it, it kind of feels like to me that most people feel like they're not going to come back to Michigan, but based on that ranking, it feels like they could potentially do themselves a lot of good by coming back to school for another year. I guess, how are you viewing those, those two guys? Like maybe where did you view them coming into the season? And then what, what, what how do you, how'd you evaluate their performance uh, this year? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that ranking kind of reflects the fact that, like, I personally think they probably should go back. Like you said, I don't know if they will. I think there's probably a pretty good chance matter does. Um, but 
um, also this, that's just sort of the way that I rank too. Like once I get to a certain point, like I start to prioritize, you know, more proven college players, um, who I, you know, or guys are upside or whatever, who I think, uh, and, and they kind of, you know, fell to that bottom of that bucket for me. But, um, I mean, I, I think starting with Houston, like he was way overranked coming out of high school, frankly. Uh, and I was, I kind of like fell prey to that too, because I thought that, uh, you know, he was really, really good, um, at the under 19 championships with Canada. And I think that had people you know, thinking he was going to have a huge year. Uh, but we overlooked, you know, some of the things that he wasn't good at. Um, now I do think like, you know, my guess would be if he stays in, like there, I think there's still a pretty decent chance he could go in the top 40, just because I think at, at least one or two teams are going to feel like, Hey, you know, there's the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. Like he is a good shooter. Uh, you know, he's got to play. Maybe there's more there. Uh, that he showed, uh, which is, you know, a reasonable thing to think. And I think, um, you know, he definitely didn't help himself. Like a lot of the time he looked like just a guy, I think for them, and, you know, he's got to get a lot stronger. Um, you know, he's got to show what he can do besides, you know, stand around and shoot threes. Like, you know, he can pass. So he doesn't really have a ton off the dribble. Uh, he wasn't a super tough player or a tough rebounder. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, when you're six, eight, six, nine, and you're a good shooter and you're still pretty young for your class, um, you know, there's a case to be made, you know, that guy's worth taking in a guaranteed deal. So it won't shock me to see, I don't know if he goes in the first round, like just off the numbers, probably shouldn't, uh, but I can see someone picking him in the thirties. Um, and I would understand that, um, you know, Diabate is someone who I was not a huge fan of coming out of high school. I just worried about his feel. I do think he actually got better at Michigan. Like I, I actually saw more positive things from him uh, relative to what I expected. Um, now I still think he's so raw that like it wouldn't, probably wouldn't hurt to go back and, and try to have like a consistent season just before you turn pro just to sort of show, you know, Hey, this is what I do and I can do it every single night and you can count on me. Cause he's right now, I don't necessarily feel that way about him, but um, you know, with his mobility and his size and he's got length, uh, you know, he, he became, I think a positive defender by the end of the year. Uh, you know, I can see, you know, why some teams might say, Hey, this is somebody that you know, we feel like our staff can get more out of, you know, either one, uh, um, you know, could, go in the top 40 or they could go later or they could end up worst case in a two way. I think Kofi, you mentioned him earlier. He's I think number 100 on your board. And, and obviously he was one of the best players, not only in the big 10, but in college basketball this season, is, is he basically looking at just trying to play his way into the league via a two way deal through the G league at this point? Or is there any chance that a team's going to look at him late in the second round and say, this is a guy we're taking a chance on. Yeah, um, I'd probably be surprised, I would say, if he is drafted, uh, just because I don't think he really fits what teams are looking for, you know, in centers right now. Um, but again, he also has gotten better, which is going to help. Um, you know, with him, it's just like he doesn't stretch the floor, he doesn't shoot free throws well, he doesn't really depend in space. Uh, you know, a guy like that would have been useful. Um, you know, 15 years ago in the NBA, 20 years ago in the NBA, because it's like, hey, you know, you can, you know, every team had a seven footer or two, right? And so you you would at least come into each game knowing that, you know, there'd at least be someone you can play this guy, match up him on for, match him up on for 20 minutes, right? But that's not the case now. Um, and his body type at this point, you know, he's actually done a great job of, you know, improving his body, but it's not going to change. Like he's always going to be a little heavier, never going to be super mobile. Um, so it's just, you know, for, for him, it's going to be tricky. I think he's the type of player where it may actually benefit him to go undrafted, you know, pick the team that you go to. Like, look, like, look, think about Utah. I mean, they took, you know, Yudoka Azubuke, you know, with the 30th pick or, you know, two years ago or whatever, right? And it's like, you know, Kofi's not as good defensively as that. You know, Yudoka hasn't panned out. He hasn't been able to stay healthy. Um, but I do think there are teams that do value bigs who do those things still. So, you know, if I'm him, I'm his agent, you know, I'm trying to steer him to a situation where he'll at least get a fair crack at like, hey, this is a role that we use, you know, off our bench and we'll give you a chance to, you know, play your way into becoming that guy. But not every team and fewer and fewer teams have that job available, right? Is it I mean, is it basically moving forward in the NBA that do you see this as a cyclical thing or do you feel like this is like here to stay in terms of bigs and how they're going to be used moving forward in the NBA or do you do you foresee a scenario in the future where back to the basket guys like that could carve out a role moving forward or, or is this kind of the new NBA it's here to stay yeah I mean I think this is kind of where it's going I think like 
it's always going to skew toward, you know, the more skilled you are, um, the better. Right. And that's, you know, kind of where, where it's been going for a while, like being able to play in space. And, and I think it's, it's a byproduct of the three point, you know, everyone taking more threes. Um, right. There is more space when there's more space. It means that fives can have, you know, have to guard on the Island more. Right. It's like, you know, if you've got four shooters and you've got your point guard or even if you're you know, defending ball screens, um, you know, you've got to be able to cover more ground and it's just those type of athletes are where it is. So like, I think, you know, I think the, you know, I don't think bigs are going to go anywhere, but it's just the type of bigs that you're going to see are going to change. Like you can look at, you know, even Chet Holmgren or, um, you know, Victor Wembanyama, who's going to be, pro- you know, probably the number one pick next year. I mean, you know, we're seeing these bigger guys with different body types, um, you know, coming in, uh, but have a chance to stick, you know, despite not being super strong necessarily, um, because they can do different types of things that, you know, make your lineups more versatile, you know? So, uh, I think it's just going that way where you're just going to see less guys with those types of bodies, uh, in the NBA, uh, you know, in college, can they still be dominant? Absolutely. Uh, but you know, even in Illinois, I think that team kind of had a ceiling because they were kind of forced to play through Kofi so often. Uh, right. You could also argue that. So, yeah. So I want to ask you about the, you know, stepping away from big 10 and trace a little bit. I just wanted to ask you about the top of your board and it seemed, I don't know how you kind of view this draft in terms of high end talent, if it's down compared to previous years, and maybe you can speak to that a little bit, but your, your top, um, your, your top guys, Jabari Smith uh, out of Auburn, number one, Jaden Ivy two, uh, Apollo three and Holmgren four. And then obviously Shaden Sharp is the guy I wanted to ask you a little bit about at Kentucky, uh, number five, just uh, how, uh, what, how, at the top, obviously, you're kind of splitting hairs trying to figure out how to rank these guys. How ultimately do you come up with like who's one, two, three, four, five, and then how do you kind of view this draft just in terms of high end talent compared to, to to previous years? Is it about the same? Is it up, down, somewhere in between? For me, um, I, I would say this year um, it took a little longer. Like most years, I think I come in knowing who number one pick is. I feel like uh, this year it took me a little longer, uh, but I settled pretty quickly on Jabari in December. Uh, I went and saw Auburn play in Atlanta. Like, you know, I watched a couple of their games and I was just like, uh, like I need to, you know, I had been planning to go down there in January, which I ended up doing anyway. And I profiled him for, for our site, but, um, you know, I ended up moving those plans up. I was like, this is pretty urgent. Uh, I went and saw him and I wa- literally, I just watched him shoot for 15 minutes before the game. And I was like, All right, this is probably what I'm going to pick. Like, there are so few guys at that size who shoot it like him. Um, and it's, you know, I think he, you know, to me is pretty clearly uh, the top prospect, like, and, you know, I've made this point like a billion times, but like, just, uh, I mean, there's different ways to argue it. I think, you know, I think if you look back at recent drafts, maybe the last 10 years, and you're, you're at a point where you feel like you're splitting hairs, uh, you know, more often than not, the guy who's the better shooter has been the right pick. Like, if it's close, like if you just look at who's had a better career to this point, like you can go back through it. And, you know, there's always exceptions, but I think that that more often than not has been kind of a, a useful rule of thumb. Um, I think when you consider that he's, you know, an entire year younger than, than Holmgren, like more than a year younger, uh, despite them being the same grade, I think that really matters. Um, I think, you know, he's what, six or eight months younger than Paulo. He's a better shooter than Paulo, a better defender, probably always will be better than him at both those things. Um, you know, Ivy is somebody who, you know, over the course of the year, I wasn't really sure because he had so many games that were duds, but also, you know, he had these flashes of brilliance. And I think ultimately, uh, what's made me with, with Ivy at number two, uh, I was at the NCAA tournament game against Texas uh, in Milwaukee, and he was just phenomenal in that game. And I had a courtside seat, uh, you know, for it, which is cool. Um, you know, at the NCAA tournament, they gave us great seats. So, so I think that, that game was kind of what ultimately swayed me, just like, you know, he was being a good teammate. He was doing the small stuff. Uh, it looked like he was having fun and like, you know, for a lot of the year, it was kind of unclear, you know, you probably watch enough Purdue games also that, you know, you saw those things with him where, you know, he was a different day. He looked like a different player, but like just knowing that he had that in him matters to me, like knowing you can bring it out of him and you know, hoping that, you know, as he gets older and matures, you know, as we all did when we were, you know, 20, 19, you know, he grows into, you know, more of a guy, you know, who can lead and other teammates want to follow. And so the talent, I don't question with him. I think he's going to keep getting better. And, you know, he's someone who I'm excited about. So that's sort of how I settled on one and two. And then, you know, I lean Paulo over Chet. I think it's pretty, pretty close between those guys. Um, but like, if I, if I were sure everything that Chet was going to do translated, I would probably put him ahead. Uh, but I am not 100% sure. And I think that, 
you know, I was at the game where they played each other, Gonzaga Duke, and you know, I walked away from that feeling a little more comfortable with Paolo. And as the year went on, um, I kind of you know felt the same way. Um, but that's kind of how I landed on those top four guys in that in that order, rather, because I think everyone has the same top four at this point in time. So Shaden Sharp's a guy that we didn't see all year at Kentucky, obviously enrolled mid year. And I think a lot of people thought when he did that, he was going to be there for the next season. And then we find out he's graduated from high school and he's not eligible for the draft. And, you know, living down here in Louisville heard from a lot of, it seemed like a lot of Kentucky fans were kind of mystified as to kind of what exactly happened there, but he's, he lands in your top five. So it, it almost feels like maybe he was reward, rewarded a little bit for not playing because he's a little bit of a mystery man, but what, what, I guess goes into having him in the top five. Is it just basically his body of work as a high school player? And how do you evaluate a player that you didn't see play a minute of college basketball? Yeah, he's an interesting case. Um, you know, I was luckily I watched him play like two whole games at uh, Peach Jam the summer before, which ended up being useful. Um, and, you know, because of synergy, you know, we all have access to at least being able to go back and watch some of the film. Um, so, like with him, I think it comes down to like, Look, like even if he had played at Kentucky, like I think he'd probably be a top ten pick either way, just because his his movement skills, his athleticism, athleticism and tools are just uh, really really strong. Um, you know, I definitely have my questions about you know some of the smaller things with him. Like, it doesn't play make a ton. You know, sometimes he gets a little shot happy. You know, there are moments where he doesn't play as hard as you'd like him to. Um, you know, again, those are things that you know cropped up in Manny Manny a teenage shooting guard, right? So like I don't know if it's you know worth making a huge deal of those, those shortcomings. Um, you know, do I think he would have, you know, been the best freshman in the country this year? Probably not, but um, I don't think there's a lot that like, he's, he just, he's capable of a lot just based on what he can do uh, physically. And, you know, I think he projects to be a pretty good shooter. Uh, and I just think the upside is pretty obvious. The more you watch him um, and, you know, you see, you, know, you just sort of compare his, his movement skills to, uh, you know, other guys like, you know, for example, like Johnny Davis. I really like Johnny Davis. Um, I was going back and forth between those two guys, but I just think the upside with Sharp is just is higher. Just he's more athletic and uh, shoots a little bit better, right? So um, th- those are the type of determinations teams have to make. But I think that in, in a workout, the guy's going to look really good. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think he, he may not, like, crack the top four, but if somebody's going to, it might be him just because I think you can argue the upside with him. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, Unfortunately for Kentucky, it would have been fun to have him play. Um, you know, I kind of obviously would have helped everyone to, to see him play and get a better handle on where he's at. Um, but if, if you go back and, you know, look at some of the things that make him such an appealing player, like those things are going to tra- probably would have translated, you know, to the college game, you know, whether or not, you know, he played or how he played, right? Like he could have, you know, shot 30% but still look like a good shooter and still been an amazing athlete and he still would have felt the same way, maybe. So, uh, but yeah, that's one of the weirder cases, I think, in recent memory, for sure. So last thing before we get you out of here, combine next week. You're you're based in Chicago, so I assume you'll you'll be over there uh, watching everything. What what do you what do you look for going into the combine? And and a lot of these guys, as you mentioned, don't play five on five. I don't know what the cutoff is, but it seems like most of the guys, what top twenty, top twenty five, aren't going to play five on five. So are you, are you just looking at to talk to teams and kind of get feedback from them on what they think on certain guys and what are, what are kind of the things you hope to learn from, from being over there uh, next week? Yeah, definitely. Well, um, you know, I've got everybody, right. So it's like, yeah, you know, we won't see the lottery picks play, but like we don't really need to see them play more anyway. Like I think it's honestly a lot more interesting. A lot of the time, you know, we have the G league elite camp is going to be here too. Uh, you know, see who pops. Like you go to these things and you kind of let your eye travel and you, um, you know, you just try to watch. Like, I, I think that's the, you know, the best thing I can do is really just watch. And, you know, oftentimes that's helpful. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a good opportunity. You know, the whole NBA is in town. Uh, I literally, from where I live right now, I can walk. It's, you know, 15, 20 minute walk to the, to the hotel and the arena and all that. So it's very easy for me uh, now. Um, but yeah, it's a, you know, it's like a convention in some ways where, you know, things happen and you talk to people and, uh, you know, they have the pro days, which I, I think I'll be able to go to again. So I'll be able to you know see some more of these guys up close, um, you know, maybe see some guys who I didn't see in person this year. I went to a ton of games. So I've seen pretty much everyone I need to see, but there's always, you know, more you can do. Um, so I, it's always fun for me. And I think it's um, definitely interesting. Uh, you know, I think there's always some narrative. It's like, is, does the comment matter? Does it not? But it definitely does. And, you know, I think we always walk away feeling like we knew more than we did before. Um, so uh, should be, 
you know, in you know, two weeks, we'll probably have a much better handle for how things are going to go. Uh, obviously, the lottery notwithstanding, that's going to happen too. So, well, Jeremy, thanks for the time. As I told you before we start recording, I, you know, I respect your your opinion as much as anybody. I've always followed your work on Sports Illustrated. I'll look forward to your post combine big board at some point. I'm sure there'll be some changes and. Uh, Indian fans obviously uh, on the edge of their seats waiting to see what happens with Trace Jackson Davis. Uh, the Combine is going to be a big event for him. So, Jeremy, get, thanks again for the time. Really, really, really appreciate it. Yeah, much appreciated. Thanks a lot. I, I, uh, it's always nice um, you know, getting to you know, talk about this stuff and uh, before things get real, real crazy. So I appreciate you. Thanks, for everybody, listen, for listening uh, to this episode of Podcast on the Brink. If you enjoy the show, Please leave us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. Leave us a rating on uh, Spotify, and we'll be back again next week with another episode of Podcast on the Brink.